this morning I'm going to open up with a hymn. It's one that fit nicely with our service theme for this morning, but it was a very unfamiliar melody. So I didn't know that I could use it in church and use it well, but the words are beautiful. So we're going to use that as our opening prayer for this morning. Uh, let's begin with prayer. In hope my soul redeemed to bliss unending, to heaven's glorious height by faith ascending, is mindful ever that Christ did sever the bonds of death that I might live forever. In him I have salvation's way discovered, the heritage for me he hath recovered. Though death o'ertakes me, Christ ne'er forsakes me, to everlasting life he surely wakes me. O oh, may I come where strife and grief are ended, where all thy saints shall meet with peace attended. Lord, grant thy favor and mercy ever, and turn my sorrow into joy forever. Lord Jesus Christ, keep me prepared and walking, till from the veil of tears thy bride thou art taking, to dwell in heaven where joy is given, and clouds of darkness are forever riven. Amen. This weekend, we are coming to the end of the season of Trinity next week. Well, we have Thanksgiving this week, and then next Sunday we'll start a new church year. When we come to the end of the church year, our focus is on the return of Christ. And we look ahead to the confidence that we have in heaven. And that hymn does a nice job of making the bridge between the the suffering, the trouble, the turmoil that we face in this life and the hope that we have in eternal life and God's presence with us throughout that life. And you'll see that theme being brought out in our worship service this morning. Not as much of a connection to our Bible class theme, although we will see that just a little bit as well. So last week we were in Romans chapter 6. We read through verses 1 through 14 in Romans chapter 6. And... As we read through those opening verses of chapter 6, we talked about two things. Buried with Christ into death through baptism. We talked a little bit about baptism. And then the second part was raised to life through the resurrection of Jesus. So the Christian now, just like Jesus, was uh, put to death and raised to new life in the resurrection. So the Christian has been put to death, his old Adam has been put to death in baptism and raised to newness of life was the, the phrase that Paul used here in Romans chapter 6. And last week we touched on this just a little bit, but he mentioned slavery in those opening 14 verses and that's going to be one of our, our themes in verses 15 to 23. He's going to develop the idea of slavery. If you remember death and life, the old Adam, the old flesh is put to death through baptism. And Paul is going to make the connection now that when we, before our baptism, before we were brought to faith, we were slaves to what? Slaves to sin. That's right. And so he's going to come back to that just a little bit now in verses 15 and following. But he's going to do something that we don't expect. When we think about the fact that we were slaves to sin, we think, yes, I am what? What's the opposite of slavery? Freedom. Yeah, now we are free. We are free. This is a wonderful thing. And remember the me genita, the uh, God forbid, certainly not, that we talked a little bit about last week. That's going to come up a couple of times in this section too. Paul is actually going to do something unique. He's going to say, we were slaves to sin. But because of baptism, because of faith, our old Adam was put to death. We are no longer slaves to sin. He's going to tell us now that we are slaves to something else. And we think, well, wait a second. We just got out of one kind of slavery. Why would we want to go into another kind of slavery? But he's going to tell us that we are now slaves to... Okay, slaves to, that's, that's not a bad guess, slaves to righteousness. Yeah. 
And remember this word righteousness is one that we've already looked at quite thoroughly in Paul's letter to the Romans. Righteousness is related to the word justification, to justify, to declare not guilty. Because we have a righteousness now that is not our own, it is Christ's which is imputed to us. So two themes to kind of keep an eye out for as we read through these next few verses. We were slaves to sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. But now we are slaves to righteousness. But we will look at the fact that this is a good thing. We think of slavery as being bad. But in this case, slaves to righteousness, or as Luke said, slaves to Christ, is actually a wonderful blessing for us. Yes, Dory? Well, we read through 14. We're going to back up to verse 9. We read at the end through verse 14, but we are going to back up to 10 and read through all the way through 23 for this morning. All right, so uh, let's take a look at those first uh, verses 10 through 14, which is where we ended last week. Uh, I commented on this just a little bit, but briefly at the end, we'll see if there are any comments on these, this section before we go into verses 15 through 23. Uh, Dory, do you want to read verses 10 to 14 for us? The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law but under grace. All right, so he hasn't mentioned the word slavery in this section, but you can notice, you can see the connection to this idea of slaves to sin. He says we've been put to death through baptism with Christ, put to death our old Adam. And so one of the things that he talked about earlier on in the section was if we have been freed from sin, do you remember the question he asked? Why would the Christian then continue in sin if he has been set free from it? And he had that question going back just a little bit further. He said, well, let's look at that May Geneta question that he had earlier. Uh, let's see here. That is in... Uh, well, let's back up to verse 6. Let's read verse 6 first of all. That's where he brings in the idea of slaves to sin. Can you read that verse, Dory? Verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Okay, so there's where the slavery idea comes in, in verse 6. Now let's back up to verse 2. That's where this uh, phrase comes in. I forget how yours, your translation did that. Can you read verse, just the first part of verse 2? By no means we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Okay, so... Uh, Mine has, may it never be. I think the old King James, if I remember right from Charles last week, said, God forbid. So it asked this question, Shall our, should we continue in sin so that grace might increase or abound? And Paul's answer is, never. May it never be. God forbid that we should continue on in sin when we have been set free from it. We have been justified. And so he's developing that idea of slavery. We've been set free from the bondage of sin. We are no longer under the law, but we are under grace, as he says in verse 14. Uh, he says, consider yourselves, this is verse 11, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So now, and this is what we're going to develop in the next chapter. When we go into chapter 7, he's going to, de he's going to develop this idea, bondage to sin, but slaves to righteousness. The, the man that has been baptized is in a, a struggle because we still have an old sinful flesh. And this is where the idea of baptism comes in. We talked about this a little bit last week. For the Christian who has been baptized... We don't say, well, I have been baptized once and now all of my sin has been washed away. I am a new man. I am perfect in Christ. And 
I'm going to continue to walk in that. And when we don't walk in that, when we say, well, there was a problem with my baptism, I need to be baptized all over again because my baptism didn't take. So the problem isn't with baptism. What is the problem with? Our sinful nature. It's our sinful nature. So our sinful nature isn't gone, but Christ has, he has redeemed us to himself. Now we struggle with that old sinful flesh. So we have the, the sinful flesh on one side, that's called, sometimes called in scripture the old Adam. There are a couple of different terms that we have for that in scripture. The old man, the old Adam. And then on the other side, we have the the new man, the new man that is created in the Holy Spirit inside the, the believer. Now, this is what's interesting is that here's this, this human being and without the Holy Spirit, you don't have this part. The only part that you have is this part. But once, once the Holy Spirit does his work of creating faith inside that human being, now all of a sudden you have this new man that is created inside the human being. And that new man struggles in daily battle against the old Adam. And Paul is going to develop that just a little bit more in the familiar verses of Romans chapter 7. He's going to talk about that ongoing battle that's taking place. And he's kind of laying the foundation for that now with this idea of slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. This is... The old Adam, if we are in bondage to our sin, to our sinful nature, that's what we used to be, what we have been redeemed from, but we continue to struggle with. But slaves to righteousness, that's what the new man is working in us, that we might not continue on in sin, knowing that we have been redeemed from it. But it isn't an it isn't an easy battle because of that old nature that we still have that is drowned through baptism but needs to be continually drowned through, in Luther's words, daily contrition and repentance through the working of the Spirit, through the power of God's Word. That battle continues on. And if you think about this contrast here, we have this all over in Scripture. You remember what the three enemies of the Christian are? What are the three enemies of the Christian? So we have, what would this one be? That's called the flesh. The sinful flesh. That's one of them. And then we've got the devil. And we have the world, right? So the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh, Paul is describing this one here, but if we go to other parts like Ephesians chapter 6, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul talks about our battle with the devil. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the evil one uh, and the flaming darts that he throws at the Christian. We put on the, the, the armor of God. So there are different parts of, of Scripture that are going to emphasize these enemies and how dangerous they are, how deceitful they can be, and this one is going to develop our struggle with our sinful nature, our sinful flesh. Uh, so any thoughts on verses 10 through 14? Uh, verses 13, Paul, well, 13, 13 is the one where he talks about, since we have been baptized, we are no longer slaves to sin. We've been set free from bondage to our, our sinful nature. We are to use our members, I think that was the word that the NIV used, our, our members in service to the Lord, not service to that sinful master. So we have those two options. Do we want to use our bodies, our minds, the gifts that the Lord has given to us for master sin, master sinful nature, or do we want to use those members that God has given to us, the gifts that he has given to us as in the service of our, our greater master, our Lord Jesus Christ. Any thoughts, 10 through 14? We're going to get another question here. So in verse 1 and then verse 2, we had the may it never be. We're going to get another question now. Paul has said, okay, We've been set free from sin. We're no longer slaves to sin through the work of the Holy Spirit. And now he's going to say, well, what, what are we to do now? And he's going to ask another sort of 
It's not really a rhetorical question because he wants us to think about it, but it's a question that we should answer in the way that he, he gives us in verses uh, 15 and 16. Uh, so a volunteer to read verses, let's read verses 15 to 23. We'll get the whole context. We'll come back and read a couple of uh, verses at a time. Um, Luke, do you want to read 15 to 23? Yeah. What translation do you have? Uh, ESV. ESV, okay. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of these things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay. So verse 15 poses another question. It's very similar to the question that we had in verse 1 at the beginning of the chapter. Shall we sin... Because we are not under law, but under grace. So back up to verse 1. Look at the difference between what we have in verse 1 and what we get in verse 15. Are we to continue in sin so that grace might increase or abound? So his first question is a little bit different. We've heard that there is grace that God has given to us. He has justified the ungodly, the sinners. That's what we heard about in Romans chapter 5. So Paul's question is, okay, since we have been justified, we've been declared not guilty as a gift of God's grace, and it is going to be more than what we can possibly receive. It covers all of our sins. The first question that we would ask is, well, should I then continue in sin since there is grace for any sin that I might commit? And Paul's answer to that question is, absolutely not. That's not the purpose for which Christ has redeemed us. So there's question number one. Question number two is a little bit different now in verse 15. If you look at verse 14, he says, sin shall not be master over you for you are not under law, but under grace. So he's developed this idea of law and grace. And so his second question is, okay, should we sin then since we aren't under law, but since we're under grace? Similar question, but a slightly different emphasis we are no longer saved by our keeping of the law, so does that mean that we're free to do whatever we want to do? And again, Paul's answer is, may it never be. Certainly not. God forbid that that's what we would do. That's not what God has redeemed us for. And now he's going to develop this idea of slavery. He's already mentioned that we have been slaves to sin. We've been set free from that. But in our, in our human minds, and he talks about this right in the middle where he says, I'm, I'm describing this in a way that you can understand as human beings. He says, you have been set free from one master just to go into a different kind of bondage, a different type of slavery. And the human reaction is, I don't want to be under slavery. I just got set free and I don't want to be a servant to somebody else now. I want to do my own thing. But what Paul is telling us is if that's our attitude, what are we? We're right back to slaves to sin, of sin again. And so he, he develops this idea. Let's, do you have a cross-reference maybe to verse 16? Anybody have a cross-reference to Matthew in their Bible? No cross-references to Matthew. Okay, uh, stick your hand. Well, let's, let's read verse 16. Luke, can you read verse 16 one more time? Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, 
either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. What is Paul saying here? He says it really doesn't matter. You're going to be a slave to something. Right? That's, the, that's his point. We, we've been set free from bondage or slavery to sin. But his point is, you're going to be under a master. The question for us is, what master is that going to be? Who are you going to serve? You're going to serve somebody. You're either going to serve, let's go back to those three enemies again. You're either going to serve the devil. You're going to serve your sinful flesh. You're going to serve the world. You're going to serve yourself. There's, you're going to be a, serve, a servant to something, to someone. The big question for us is, who is the best one for us to be a servant of? Who are we going to serve? Are we going to serve ourselves? So this kind of relates to uh, the, big, the big question about atheists. What is an atheist? There's no God. Okay, a, a person who says that they believe that there is no God. I, I have long held that there is no such thing as an atheist because, because of what Paul says right here. An atheist says, I don't believe in this master that you want to call God. But every atheist has a master, don't they? They just don't call it G-O-D. And that's Paul's point right here. He says, yeah, you can, you can, so the, the atheist says, I don't want to be this. I want to be this. That's what the atheist says. I want to serve myself. I want to serve the world. I want to serve whatever. You can, you can call it whatever you want, but that's what the atheist is saying. There's no such thing as a true atheist, a person who says that there is no God. They have a God. They just don't want to call it that. Paul says, you're going to serve somebody. Who's it going to be? Let's back up now. Put your fingers here. Back up to Matthew, chapter 6, verse 24. I think this is a helpful cross-reference for these verses in Romans 6. Matthew 6, verse 24. Anybody have it? All right, so what translation do you have, Wade? Is NIV. That, what is it? NIV. You have NIV, okay. Um, so with some of the New King James I'm used to there at the end, God, you cannot serve God and mammon, but money is a little bit easier to understand. So there's Jesus' point too. He says, you can't serve both of these. You've got to pick one. But you're going to serve one or the other. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve the world. You're going to see, serve money. You're going to serve mammon. You're either going to love one and hate the other, or you're going to love that one and hate the other one. But you have to pick between one of those two. You're going to serve someone. So Paul, in, verse, in Romans 6, verse 16, again, says, you, you've, got to, you've got to follow one or the other. F find your allegiance Who's your master going to be? You're going to have a master. And now what he's going to do in verses 17 and follow, he's, he's going to build a case. As human beings, we're always wrestling with these two masters. Like I said, the atheist says, this is the master that I want to serve. And they come to that conclusion because they believe that that's what's best for them to some degree. I can do what I want to do. I can be happy by doing what I want to do. Now, Paul's going to make the case, no, that's not really true. He's going to make the case that rather we are better off to be slaves to God in righteousness because that's actually what's better for us and that's actually going to bring us a greater happiness, not only temporarily, but also, and more importantly, long term. So, as we're reading through these next couple of verses, kind of pay attention to the fact that he's building a case against the individual who says, I think it's better to have this guy as my master. 
I'd rather serve my sinful nature. I'd rather have, I'd rather be in bondage to sin because it sounds a whole lot more fun. Paul says, no, let's look at the case for why it's better to be a slave of righteousness. Uh, let's go on. Verse 17, Luke. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Keep going, one more. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. All right, so we've been, we've been taken out of the bondage to one. And, and what does he say? He says, we should thank God for this. Thank God that we have been removed from the bondage of sin and placed into, into the responsibility, the hands of, of the Lord, that we have been made now slaves of righteousness. So he begins by simply saying, let's give God thanks for the fact that we are no longer what we used to be. Now he's going to build it just a little bit more. Verse 19, Luke. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Okay, let's develop this just a little bit. What are the, what are the words that he has that are related to slavery to sin? What words does he use to describe the result of slavery to sin? There are three of them, if I counted correctly. Impurity. impurity. Now, again, you might have a different, depending on the translation. So and I, uh, ESV has impurity. What else? Lawlessness. Lawlessness. And? Is there one more? Oh, yeah, resulting in more lawlessness. Okay, so, and then more. That was the third one that I was thinking of. And then on the other side, he says, what is the result of being slaves to righteousness? Sanctification. Sanctification. All right, so let's look at those words for just a minute. I try this with kids all the time because uh, by nature... By nature, we think this is great. So I usually try this on, on the confirmation kids in particular. And I will tell them, what would you think about a, a world where there weren't any rules? And they're like, oh, that would be so much fun. I wouldn't have to do my homework. I won't have to go to bed at a certain I could do whatever I wanted to do. And so I, I, I expect that re result. They never disappoint me. And so we, we then develop that idea just a little bit. And I say, okay. That sounds good on the surface. You don't have any of these rules. You can do whatever you want to do. What happens when, you know, what, first of all, I'll ask them, what are you doing with your, your free time? Oh, I'm watching TV. I'm playing video games. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. What happens when, since there aren't any rules, somebody breaks into your house and steals your TV and your video game console? How do you like that? Well, I just go and steal it back. You know, that's usually the result. And so now you get this, this fight back and forth, and, and ultimately the one who's going to win is whoever's the strongest, at least for a short period of time. So then I use the illustration of, of King on the Mountain. You remember King on the Mountain? You know, you get one guy on the top of the hill, and that one guy gets up there, and you got one person who's trying to push him off, but this is a big, strong guy on the top of the hill, and he keeps pushing down every, you know, each one of these little guys that keeps climbing up until all of the little guys realize that they can't beat him individually. And so then they, they join together and then they knock the big guy off and then they take over. So you're always, sooner or later, you're going to lose. And what we have here is we have impurity. We have selfishness. We have something that is the opposite of what is good, what is, what is pure. And there is no law. There's lawlessness. And that is never a good thing. Not for anyone, not for any society. And when you have lawlessness, as Wade pointed out, that only works into more lawlessness. It only gets more, more bad. It's not going to get better when you start removing rules or laws. So Paul's saying, is that really what we want? Kind of like talking to the confirmation kids. If you really look at where that's going to go, where it's going to end up, does that sound like a pleasant place to live? Living constantly in fear, wondering whether somebody's going to take what you have earned or worked hard to get, 
whether they're going to take your freedom, whether they're going to take whatever it is that you have, does that sound like a pleasant society, a place where we want to be? Hopefully not. But he says, in contrast to being slaves to sin, which lead to these things, if we are slaves to righteousness, then it results in sanctification. What is sanctification? That's an important word in the Bible. Make holy? Yeah, to... So, one definition of it is to make holy, and that can certainly be the case. I like the, the definition of being set apart as special. So, it can lead to that ultimate goal of being holy, and it can have that idea. But what, what's interesting about this word is that God takes us... And he pulls us out of the impurity and the lawlessness of the world. And he sets us apart for his own purposes. So this word sanctification is the same word that's used in the Old Testament to describe the items that were used in the temple. And so you have, if you think about the temple and the worship of the temple, they had an, an altar of incense and the priests would come in and they had tongs that they would use in order to move the coals from the fire and then they would have bowls that they would use to put the incense in in order to melt it and to get the sweet smell. All of these things. Well, these are things that you would find in your kitchen. A lot of, a lot of Israelites would have some of these items like bowls and tongs and things like that in their kitchen. But when God said, I want you to make these things and this is what they're going to look like, they were set apart for special purposes. They weren't those common things that were used in their everyday life. They were special because they were used for God, for His glory. And God says, that's what I've done with you. I've removed you out of the world, out of the commonness of the world, set you apart from impurity and lawlessness, that you might be set apart for my purposes, for holy purposes, to use Dory's word. And that's the opposite of, for we might use pure purposes, and lawful purposes, purposes that are in line with what God desires for us as human beings and for our society. So Paul, again, begins to make this case, is this really what we want? Because if we do this, this is going to be the result. But if we want this, we have to realize that we, we are under Christ set apart for His purposes. Yes, those tongs and bowls and things in the temple were still used for a particular purpose, but they were used for holy purposes, not impure or lawless purposes. They were used for God's purposes. And God desires to do that with each one of us, to remove us from lawless, impure purposes, and to set us apart for His purposes, for lawful, pure, holy purposes, in our lives. Any thoughts? 17, 18, 19. Okay, let's, let's take a look at 20 to 23. Luke, do you want to review those? For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit you were getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed, for the end of those things is death. But now, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, so you notice how he's going to develop this just a little bit more again. He says, all right, we've determined what the result of slavery to sin is. It's impurity, it's lawlessness, uh, and it increases to even more lawlessness. He says, now, one thing that we might say is a, an argument for being a slave to sin is that when we're a slave to sin, we are free in regard to righteousness. We aren't, we aren't bound by the law. We don't have to do certain things. And that might seem like an argument. A lot of atheists will actually give you that as an argument as to why they want to be a slave of sin because they're free. They can do whatever they want to do regarding when they say we're free. What they mean is that they are free to not have to do the things that God says is good. That's what they're free from. They're free from righteousness. But here's Paul's final, the final dagger into the idea of slavery to sin. 
He says, yes, when you were slaves of sin, you were free regarding righteousness. And what was the benefit? What were, what were, you, what, what were you getting out of these things which you are now ashamed? He says, the outcome of impurity, lawlessness, and more lawlessness, what is it? Death. Death. He said, let's be realistic here because if this is the path that you want to follow, which leads to impurity, lawlessness, and even more lawlessness, the ultimate result is death. But, he says, if you're going to be a slave to righteousness, which leads to sanctification, sanctification is going to lead to what? Life. So you have, again, a contrast You've got a contrast between impurity, unholiness, and holiness. You have a contrast between death and life. And we get those very, very familiar words at the end of this chapter. Many people have memorized verse 23. The wages of sin. The wages of sin is death. And it's important to notice those, the, the terms that he uses there when he connects sin to death and righteousness or sanctification to life, he calls this wages. But what is the connection here between righteousness and life? Gift. Gift. Notice the difference. Wages is something that is earned. We work, we earn a wage. And usually we think of wages as being a good thing, but Paul twists it here and he uses it as, as the point that, yes, if we are slaves to sin, we live for ourselves, we live for our flesh, what we earn, this is what we deserve maybe is a better word even than earn, what we deserve because of our sin is death. But he makes the point that if we become slaves of righteousness, we don't earn anything. We don't deserve anything anything. But what we receive is God's gift. It is a gift of eternal life. So there's some beautiful ways in which Paul develops this idea. Again, this is the argument that people have presented throughout history. We take a look at atheists today and we can see these, these are the arguments that they're debating. I don't want to do this because that's, that's, that's brutal. I, I want to live for myself. I want to be free. But they don't understand that by, by being, what they're being free, what they want to be free from is the righteousness of God. And that the result of that is, is not good. That it's not good for them. It's not good for those who are around them. That only brings more destruction, more devastation, more impurity, more lawlessness, and ultimately it leads to death. So Paul's point here is trying to get the individual who's struggling with, I don't want to be a slave to understand that by being a slave to Christ, we are actually receiving something that is wonderful. Not just wonderful in the end, in giving us the gift of eternal life, but also wonderful right now in this life because lawful behavior, pure behavior, holy living is not only good for us even in this life, it's good for those around us. When we, are, when we don't steal, that's a benefit to our society. When we don't speak poorly about other people breaking the Eighth Commandment, that is a benefit to our society. When we don't kill, that is a benefit to our society. So Paul says, this is what God wants for us because this is, this is just a glimpse when we see the Ten Commandments. The, the Ten Commandments give us a glimpse of what it will be like in heaven in a perfect way. There won't be any breaking of the Ten Commandments. But imagine... Imagine a heaven that doesn't have the Ten Commandments. That's this. Is that the kind of place that we would want to be? In a place that's lawless and impure? That can't work. A lot of times you have people that want to set up governments that look like that. Uh, you think about anarchies or dictatorships or things like that. And, and whenever this, you know, they say, oh, we're going to remove those people that are in power because they're corrupt. Well, when you remove somebody who's in power that's corrupt, what do you replace it with? Another person that's corrupt to one degree or another. There are no perfect human beings. And that's why there's no perfect 
human society either. There are some that certainly function or can function better than others, but ultimately because of human beings and the sinful nature that we have, the struggle between the old Adam and the new man, you're going to have imperfect government agencies. You're going to have un imperfect individuals that are ruling uh, the population. You can have some that are better than others. That's certainly the case. But we're not going to see a perfect society that is what God points us to here in the Slaves of Righteousness until, until finally we get to heaven. Any thoughts on Romans 6? Any questions? So is there anything that I missed up in 10 through 14 from last week that anybody wanted to ask about? You have the idea of death and life that are, that's brought out in verses 10 to 14, which Paul then comes back to right at the end, uh, death and life in verse 23. So next week we'll start on chapter 7. These verses are, are somewhat familiar to us as well. Uh, we're going to begin just with the first six verses, but this is the chapter where Paul is going to, he's going to talk about the, the problem, the struggle between the old Adam and the new man. Uh, the good that I want to do, that I don't do. The evil that I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. Uh, he's going to develop that, that battle between the old sinful flesh and the new man that goes on within the Christian, this side of heaven. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about that in Romans chapter 7. No thoughts? No questions? A very, very powerful section. Uh, Paul talks a lot about slavery and slavery to righteousness or slavery to Christ in not just in, in his letter to the Romans, but in a lot of his letters. And again, that cross-reference that we had in Matthew chapter 6 is a helpful one. He says, we're going we're gonna to be a servant to something. We just have to answer for ourselves, what is that something going to be? Do we want that something to be a dictator, a lawless leader uh, like, like the flesh? Or do we want that, that master that we have to be one who is good, who gives life, and who graciously provides because of his grace, even for those who do not deserve? That's, that's the master that we want to serve, one who, who uses his power and his love in a way that shows concern for his creation, and that's what we have in Christ. All right, let's close then with the benediction, the blessing of our Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.